Well, Rob, you know, we're not going to let you get away so easily. After being on Wall Street for five or six years, seven years, I can't remember when you told me the story, but uh, I'm sure you have some good tales from the trading desk for us. So what do you got in store for us? Okay, so uh, probably one of the most memorable uh, um, episodes from my career. So I started in 2002, um, and I was on, on Wall Street for about 15 years. Um, when I, I was at Goldman Sachs for uh, seven years, that was my initial job. My next job was at Caxton Associates, which is a macro fund. I started there as an equity strategist in London. Um, I did, but Rob, by the way, I didn't mean to, to say you were only six or seven years. I guess it was six or seven years at, at Goldman. And then you were at Caxton for another six or seven, for another eight years. Is that right? So, so uh, Goldman for uh, six years, Caxton for one year, Citigroup for three years, uh, and then uh, uh, some buy side uh, roles okay. for, the, for the remaining career. So jumped around a lot. Um, but, you know, so I left Goldman Sachs prop desk in um, 2008. Uh, and my first week at Caxton, uh, I had just started out. Um, it was October 15th, 2008. And uh, that's when uh, the Bank of England lowered rates by 150 bips. It was a huge surprise to the market. Caxton made uh, uh, more than a billion dollars that day in flattener trades. And uh, I had no idea what was going on. I, I was kind of like sitting at my desk and, and all of a sudden everybody's uh, it's like when, when, you know, someone wins the World Series or the championship, like people jump up and down. All of a sudden everyone started jumping up and down. And I was like, what is this? This place is great. I love it. <laughs> uh, and I also didn't know what a what a flattener was coming from equity land. So, you know, I was like, what's going on? It's like, oh, the flattener. Uh, and I was just like, I, I have no idea what that means. Uh, <laughs> Wait. So when the when the Bank of England did a surprise cut, it actually caused the curve to flatten, not steepen. I wouldn't uh, guess that. Uh, so it, I think I think they were. It was uh, so. See, I still don't know anything about macro. Uh, so I think they had. Um, they they basically uh, had. Um, uh, it, it was probably receivers. They had a bunch of receivers and swaptions on. Uh, and uh, uh, oh, okay. w w whatever you people do in fixed income that uh, <laughs> that, that benefit from from lower rates, uh, it was and they had it on in massive size and and every macro shop had it on in massive size in 2008. But um, that one day was just like I think the the point where uh, basically uh, the market just totally repriced rate expectations. Well, that's oh, awesome. that's hilarious. That's a great story. Billion dollars. <laughs> Just like that. Just like that. Like yeah. Easy come, Just easy like, go. Like yeah. winning the Super Bowl all of a sudden. Everybody's cheering their team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, it was so interesting, though, because so many macro people were bearish in 2008 and so many didn't flip in 2009. Uh, and that was a really interesting dynamic to see kind of, uh, you know, uh, how, you know, how very sophisticated investors view the market, how they view the present. Uh, and that was actually the time when uh, my uh, the the CIO of Caxton, Andrew Law, at the time was like, "You need to learn technicals," because I I turned out to be I was super bearish because I was caught up in this whole bearishness. And March of 2009, everything started trading really well. Uh, he was one of the first ones to flip his book, um, and he was just like, "You need to learn technicals because the market is telling us that we're wrong." And I'm like, "Technicals? That sounds stupid." Like. <laughs> Why would, that sounds why would, like Kevin still to this day. Yeah. No, that's not true. I, 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 I would argue that when your P and L is is telling you you're wrong, that that's the that's my technicals. But uh, it's great. That's actually interesting. It's an interesting observation and something that I found. I'm continually amazed at how many hedge fund kind of supposedly gurus. Uh, they just all they can do is go around looking for the next 2008. They made it that that one period had such a large kind of outsized uh, kind of scar on their on their trading mentality that all they can do is imagine it occurring over and over again. Yeah, and 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 chasing or trying to find the asset that's the next 2000, you know, next mortgage mortgage crisis, um, and that's yeah. like one one of like my pet peeves whenever people are just this is just like. You know, and then they name a year, 1999 or 2008, uh, when in reality it's like 2008 wasn't like any period before, and 1999 wasn't like any period before, uh, and I'm sure 2000, you know, 19 and 20 is not going to be like any period before, so or it's not going to be exactly like any period before. So um, that's you know, I, I uh, totally agree with that point. Yeah. Whenever people try to live in uh, 2008, the other thing that I find, Rob, is that uh, 
they all take for granted that it was so easy to pick off the dot com bubble or to pick off the real estate bubble or slash, you know, credit in, in real estate. And the reality is that if you were bearish on either one of those, you had gotten hammered so often for so long that almost nobody was bearish at the top. Like it was, it, there's so few people. I, that's uh, that's such a great point. And um, I was a pretty junior analyst in uh, 2005, 2006, 2007. But we had a really robust debate internally in Goldman Sachs research whether there was a, whether you know housing would decline or whether uh, you know, we we didn't say housing bubble because at the time no one said housing bubble. People said housing was expensive. I think in retrospective, because of what happened, people were saying housing bubble. But at the time, there was a really, really um, robust debate and, you know, really good arguments. We've made it like housing is a new asset class. You have all this money flowing in, um, you know, globally. Why would an asset class globally be overvalued? Something must be changing. Demographics, blah, blah, blah. Um, and obviously, in retrospect, it's really easy to say, like, oh, housing was in a bubble and stocks were in a bubble. But as you mentioned, like Julian in 1999 just gave up because, he just couldn't predict how long it would last. So, right, yeah, and and it's it's the thing that we expect the least that's going to hurt you the most, and so I, I contend that that's going to be uh, traditional fixed income when inflation comes. But Patrick's going to tell me otherwise. Other, anyways, <laughs> thank you very much uh, for that. Tales from the trading desk. It's terrific. Uh, you know, it's a great story. Thanks for sharing that with us. All right, yeah. and everyone stick around for uh, more Rob in the after hours. He'll be joining us once uh, at the tail end of the show. So if you want more Rob, stick around.